And uh, we're on Derek Ducart's farm. Derek is uh, second, third generation farmer. Third generation farmer. His uh, farmstead is about a mile over the hill over here. And he's been working with us on the on the SARE project. He's on the uh, Research Center's advisory board. And so we get some really good feedback from him. And uh, he's been working with cover crops and, and different different things on his farm and so he's going to he's going to share with us the things that he's learned and uh, so I just turn it over to Derek and let him let him tell us what he's what he's going to talk about today. Thank you Doug. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. We passed out some sheet or a sheet of some of the things that we've done the last couple of years uh, just concerning cover crop working with the SARE on Doug's project here and uh, Doug kind of coined the, the phrase, the effect of cover crops on, on the crop rotation and yield and cattle feed. And we did a little bit of economic data with, uh, we worked with uh, our uh, North Dakota Farm Business Management Group. And uh, so we have some enterprise data that we can, can uh, use for economics of is this working, is this not working. Um, but last year we, or, we started with SARE in 2012, and actually this was some of the first field, one of the first fields that we worked with. We seeded a full season cover crop, and uh, some of the conditions are probably pretty close to being the same back in 2012. Uh, this is a full season cover crop in the field. It's a mix of oats, peas, turnip, lentils, Turnip radish, there's purple top turnip. Uh, there might be two types of clover in there. It comes from Pulse, it's their, just their basic uh, cover crop mix. Um, we seeded this in late April, uh, no fertilizer. Uh, last year's crop was wheat. The crop before that was corn. And then the crop before that, back in 2012, was actually um, was a cover crop. We did the same thing, we used our cows to graze it. And you can see the cows in, in the background there. This year, we actually weighed the cows going in and the calves uh, to see a start weight. And then when we finish, we're going to see if we got, you know, did we gain weight? Did we gain body condition? Uh, these calves are all May, June born calves, um, Red Angus cows. And we're just breeding, so they're only going to be in their first trimester. So, uh, but. The last couple of years we've been using full season cover crops, seeding them in late June, late July. Uh, two years ago we seeded a cover crop. It was wet, wet, and wet, as most of you know. And uh, the first picture there is actually uh, the cows on that cover crop in March of 2014. No, 2013. And no, 2014. We, we got really late in getting the cows on the cover crop. Uh, the second picture there is we had another small field that we just turned some uh, yearling bulls into when it was actually in the greener stages and uh, got about three weeks of grazing with 25 head of bulls on there. And the next picture is just what that aftermath looks like. We tried to leave about 50% of it on the field. Uh, in the field that we used, uh, the full season cover crop, uh, we seeded corn in that field in March of uh, 2014. Uh, went with uh, a decal variety of corn, 82-day uh, maturity. Uh, population, we pushed the population on it uh, to 24,000 and hoping for about a 22,000 population when it was all said and done. Um, we did go with 200 pounds of uh, urea. Uh, that was a mistake in terms of the applicator was set wrong and we just got too much fertilizer on it. In hindsight, we thought it was going to hinder the pot or uh, the corn, but it actually didn't. We had pretty good conditions. And then we went down with 150 pounds of starter and then uh, two applications of Roundup. Uh, in that cover crop preceding that, we had a lot of millet. Uh, Proso millet was in that mix. It went to seed on us and we have 10 years of millet growing. So uh, hence the, the two applications of Roundup to get rid of the millet. 
because it was just like a carpet all summer. But it rained and it rained and it rained in 2014. Uh, next picture is just a picture of the corn in August. Um, probably just prior to last year's field day that we had here. And then uh, the next picture was when we started harvest in November of 2014. Uh, some of the yield and economic data on that. Uh, when it was all said and done, we had 120 bushel corn average per acre. Uh, the value at the harvest time was $3.10. Our gross income per acre was $372. The total direct expenses towards the corn was $264 for a return uh, direct expenses of 107 uh, Our cost of production per bushel was 269 that include labor and management. Uh, so we had some flexibility in terms of selling it. Uh, the corn weighed right at uh, I think 55, 52, somewhere in there. Um, we did have a control within the field where we didn't put any fertilizer. Uh, and we actually saw no results above and beyond of what fertilizer. Everything was about on par. Um, we didn't touch the residue uh, when we we combined it just with a regular combine. Uh, didn't put any cows on it to graze it off. We left the residue. We went back in with spring wheat this year. Uh, did apply or did fertilizer did fertilize test that field right after harvest last year. And we still had 51 pounds of nitrogen left in the profile in the top 24 inches of the, of the soil. Uh, my sister's an agronomist. She soil tested the field. She's still trying to figure out what happened. When we started the field, we had 74 pounds of nitrogen left in the field. And that was back in 2013 when we did that last test on it. So we have a lot of nitrogen in the soil. We still had 32, pound, or 32 parts per million of phosphorus. We have a high potassium level of 355. Our chloride is at 28, sulfur is at 50. Our organic matter is slowly climbing. We're up at 3.6. I think when we started that field, we were in the twos. So we're, we're, we're gaining in organic matter. And then our soil pH is a 7.4, which is slowly growing. Hopefully it's gonna stabilize. Um, this spring, we did see spring wheat into that field. And by the picture, that us, that's not me just playing around. Uh, we did get stuck. Uh, we found a soft spot in the field. It happens, you get stuck and you go on. To this day, that piece, it's about an acre in size and we never got through it. We actually went in with some cover crop and actually hand spread it just to get the moisture out. So we have a lot of moisture in the profile. Uh, we took the weed off here in uh, August. Uh, we averaged 51 bushels per an acre with uh, 66 pound wheat, and but it was only between 12 and 13 protein, hence the 66 pound wheat. Uh, it was nice to have, it was beautiful colored wheat, uh, only dockage was about 0.7, so, but still in the 12, 13 protein, so it didn't make us a whole lot of money. We kind of broke even on the deal. But we have a lot of residue. We're actually go back in that with, uh, this year we're gonna try a winter wheat variety forage winter wheat uh, and, and uh, along same with this field here we'll actually go in with uh, a winter wheat variety of forage um, this, this this year uh, we tried to mimic some of those same results hopefully by planting a full season cover crop again last year and uh, you'll see what the, is in the mix and that mix is pretty much standard for our full season cover crops especially when we're going to seed it in that June and July time frame. Um, the dollars per acre is going to vary depending on the sources of the seed that we get it from. Uh, this year we were running in that dollar uh, 35 Levi. I can't remember exactly. There's my cousin Levi. Do you remember the price that we... Levi? Um, or Luke, sorry. It was a dollar 35, dollar 40 somewhere in there per pound. Yeah. For, for our custom blend that we have. Yeah, that and when you go over to section 19, you'll, right by our approach, you'll actually see that variety. Uh, we seeded that after a winter triticale, hairy vetch, last year. And uh, 
the field was so wet this year we just couldn't get into it till about the 15th of July. And it's it's about knee high in places. Uh, had some, uh, as you know, we had a lot of heat here in the last month and very little precip in our area. So uh, that's why this cover crop is still brown. We have a cover crop that's about 10 miles away, seeded about the same time, and uh, it's grass green. And it just hence a little extra moisture makes a big difference. You're welcome to walk out into the field. You'll see the turnips, the purple tops, they're actually, they died off, the leaves died off, but actually we had a little bit of moisture here last week, and they're starting to regenerate. Um, this morning I had a guy call uh, from up around Alexander, and uh, he had a field of forage barley with a forage turnip in there. He grazed it in July, pulled the cows off. He's had about two inches of rain now, and actually all the forage turnips are actually starting to regenerate, and he's going to get some extra growing or grazing days when he's all said and done. Um, by no means, we've planted cover crops and they've failed. We've planted cover crops when we shouldn't be. They work. They always work. They always do their job. They cycle nutrients for us. Um, our best option right now is, is our full season cover crops. Just with the economics of, of wheat, uh, we probably won't grow another kernel of wheat on our farm for a while until the economics can tell us that we can make some money at it. We can make money growing sunflowers. We can make money growing corn following a cover crop and uh, and using our cows to, to do that. Last year we grew, had a 28-acre field that we had a cover crop in, a full-season cover crop. We actually had 254 cows in that field pretty much all winter. We did feed a little bit of hay out there. Uh, we, it's very, very heavy clay-type soil. Um, probably didn't get the cows moved off in time. Had a little bit of plugging action, but I was going in with corn, so I wasn't too worried. And uh, if you were to actually walk in that field today, the corn's not super tall on very limited moisture, but we are looking at about an 80 bushel crop if it comes through. Um, but there's still plenty of residue covering the ground, so and the corn is still grass green. There's a few yellow spots in the field, and we did have a few spots where the residue was probably a little bit heavier than we'd like didn't have the germination, but then we also dropped the population down to about 23,000 this year. Hence, it was just a little bit drier this summer. But the years look like they're going to fill right to the end, and uh, time will tell come October, November when we start harvesting. So, if there's any questions, I'll, I'll gladly answer, or hopefully answer. I have one, Derek. You, you talked about the farmer who had uh, regrowth on the turf. Uh, you know, and I don't know the answer, but do you know of any, uh, any, any issues with those turnips? Do they, do, do they uh, accumulate any nitrates or prussic acid or any of those things that have to The question was, is grazing these turnips, is there any uh, backlash, basically, if, if there's any nitrates left in them? Uh, there's still 46 cows out there yet and 46 calves. So I'm pretty happy there's nothing happening yet. And uh, we haven't seen anything. We went through some dry years in, in 2012 when we started. And the turnips were about the same size that year. And uh, I think uh, if there's enough other residue or enough of other forage for them to mix with it, it's amazing. You watch these cows. We rotate about every three days. We use a single wire hot fence. and. Uh, they, uh, they'll actually go in and nip all the oat heads off first. And then they'll maybe go in and start nipping off some of the, the greener forage, chew on the weeds. Uh, I got a young bull in there, and he, uh, it's amazing. He'll go over and find a head of oats. He'll chew that off, and then all of a sudden you'll find him chewing on a piece of weed. So that, I think they balance their diet. And the last thing they actually chew on is the purple top turnips. And... Uh, some of them, they couldn't quite figure it out at first, but uh, if you were to walk all the way down to where the cows are at, they start dishing them out. And uh, you can actually see their teeth marks. And they just kind of go to the ground level, and that's it, unless they roll them out of the ground. But uh, there's some that are probably about 10 inches in diameter in the lower spots. So, Farah? Um, your forage weed, are you going to use that for early grazing 
next year or bail it? Yeah. We'll see what our spring does. Uh, the last couple of springs we haven't been able to get on and use it for, for spring grazing. Um, I'm kind of hoping I can get to use it for spring grazing. It just depends on the growth rate. But the last few years we've been just growing it for hay and then following with the cover crop. How long have you had them in that piece? We've been here 10 days. We started last Two. Monday and uh, we've moved like I think four times now. So uh, I just moved them yesterday morning. So. Oh, you just keep moving them? Yep. I, I give them about, uh, this is a 30 acre field and uh, I think it's like an acre, uh, not uh, three acres roughly, somewhere in there. I kind of step off three steel post, run my wire, and then just kind of gauge it. They can have access to this wheat field that we harvested. So if I see them over there, it's telling me that I should move. So, so they just got access to this and the wheat field? Yep. Okay. Yep. When you see triticalia, you always put vetch in, carry vetch? Or? The question was, uh, when we seed winter triticale, if we always add hairy vetch, and the answer is it depends on the price. Uh, hairy vetch can be very expensive. Um, you could probably have just as many dollars in hairy vetch as you do in rent And uh, most of the time we do, um, but uh, depending on the source, one year we had hairy vetch, or we had vetch, but it wasn't hairy vetch. We come to find out, and that didn't overwinter very well. It died. And uh, this last winter, we thought we lost it, and actually it came back really nice this spring. And uh, what, we, is the, excuse me, what is the mix? How much hairy vetch? Uh, last year we did a, it was like 53 pounds, 54 pounds of winter triticale with 6 to 8 pounds of hairy vetch. And then we add at least a couple pounds of uh, either red or yellow clover with it. And uh, the yellow clover usually typically overwinters pretty pretty well. The red clover, it's a hit and miss, depending on the variety. And you seed it about now? Yeah. We'll actually seed it around the 15th of September, roughly, somewhere in there. Um, we'll probably do a burn down uh, to get rid of some of the, the grasses or volunteers that are out there, and then go in and seed it. And since we've never fertilized it when we've seeded it, and uh, we've always just went in uh, just straight winter tree to Kaylee, hairy veg, this year we're probably going to go down with a little bit of uh, starter fertilizer to see if we're going to have any difference in terms of overwintering. And then in the spring we typically go in with uh, 100 pounds of uh, nitrogen broadcast and uh, just to give it a little bit of a start. Did you burn this down? What did you use to burn down? We burned it down with Roundup. Just Roundup? Just Roundup. One, one application. No LV6, nope, because we didn't want to have uh, the uh, um, kill any of our broadleaves, any carryover with 240. Uh, this field actually looked pretty tough when we seeded it. We had some bug issues early on. We had some frost. It actually came through pretty, pretty well, you know, considering our conditions that we had this year. Um, one thing that we always have to worry about if you're seeding hairy vetch into a standing or harvested wheat is some of the carryovers in chemical. They will kill the hairy vetch. I mean, that's one year we did have that happen. We used, I think it was a, either Wolverine or Wide Match, or, and uh, it carried over and killed our hairy vetch. The, it sprouted, but it just never, never overwintered, and that's what we traced it back to. So what is the dollar amount you would pay for vetch, hairy vetch? Wink, what is it right now? What do you guys got it priced at? Two ten a pound. That's expensive. Last year was it like, what did I pay? I can't remember right offhand. But, uh, I think it was about 50 cents cheaper. Cheaper. Once it gets over that $2 range, it gets to be pretty spendy. And, uh, so would you put in clover then? For it depends. Uh, If I had a choice, since I'm fertilizing probably in the spring, this next year I'm going to probably try and uh, with my dry fertil or with the dry fertilizer application, I'll probably mix either the hairy vetch or a vetch of some sort 
and the clovers with it and broadcast it and hopefully to get a little bit more uh, bang for my buck um, it, it's a it's a good thought i'm hoping that i can get it accomplished so if the, it's one of those things come spring you have a million things to do and uh, some of our forage stuff always gets left behind. Well, is hairy bitch kind of, I, I was reading on the internet, it's kind of like a weed, I mean, it can get away on you, is that true? It can, if it does go to seed. It uh, can be invasive. I mean, we have it naturally, vetches naturally in our prairie. Oh, it is. And, uh, but it, if you let it go to seed, it, it'll be around for a long time. Every once in a while we have some that'll pop up, um, but, uh, not too often. I mean, with some of our Roundup, we'll take care of it. Or if you had uh, in our corn crop, use it, the use of chemicals will get rid of it. But uh, it will show up. What's the cost on your winter to killing? Luke, what are we at this year? 38 cents yep. per pound. And that's just a standard variety, I think, this year. Yep. And the forage wheat is about the same, right? Yep. Yeah. It's gone up. Oh, probably double since we've started using winter triticale. I think we could used to get it for like 15 to 20 cents when I first started. And I did save some of my own seed through the years, but last year we had a really nice stand of winter triticale that I was going to take to harvest. And uh, kind of like all small grains last year, it sprouted on me. And uh, so we didn't harvest it. We just went in there with the hay vine, bailed it up. And I still haven't figured out where I get all my winter triticale that's volunteer growing around. And it's actually shooting ahead this year. Wherever we fed that winter triticale hay, we have volunteer winter triticale coming that's actually blooming. So we're not quite sure if it was the fact that it sprouted and it stayed viable all winter. And it just, we're not sure. The forage weed is that, would you say that was running a pound? 38 cents. And it's at about 50 pounds, 50 to 60 pounds in a mix. Is there that much advantage on the forage wheat versus if you plant it the winter wheat? Or? The forage wheat doesn't have any ponds. It's beardless. The winter triticale will have beards. Uh, there was a nice stand of winter uh, forage wheat uh, not too far from here this summer. That, it stood really nice. And uh, I think, I haven't seen, I haven't asked him if he, did a feed test on it yet, but ours came back at about 7 protein with about 55 TDN on it. And that was rained on a couple of times. So, Any other questions? In this field, we will go back in with uh, more likely corn next spring. Would it reseed itself next year? If we get enough rain, a lot of this will probably sprout yet this year. And because uh, the, the, the radish does bolt on us and does go to seed, as that's one issue if you do put radish in early. And uh, it, it, it seeds, seeds itself early, or goes to seed early. If you seed it this time of the year, it should grow a nice rip. But we seed it some in July and it's actually bolting already so it's doing what it's supposed to do it reproduce itself Thank <laughs> you.